Okay, so today I'm going to lecture on section 3.1. Uh, just to remind you, what would help is if you print out the chapter 3 homework. Specifically for today, you should have the section 3.1 problem sitting in front of you. I'm going to, normally when I lecture, I mostly do even problems, so you'll be able to uh, follow along better if you have it printed out. And it would be a great use of your time as if I, as I do a problem, you do a problem. So for instance, a pretty soon here I'm going to do problem two. Almost certainly after I complete problem two, you should complete problem one. So after you watch me do problem two in the video, you should pause the video, work problem one. If problem two inspired you enough to be able to go through and work all the problems in the first six seconds, in the first six, that would be fantastic. Every time you do a problem, you should make sure your answer is right. There are answers available on my webpage, so you should, you know, also have the answers opened up as you're working out the problem so you can check yourself. All right, so um, the very first problems have the instructions which of the relation define y as a function of x? And in order to do these problems, we need to know what it means for to be y to be defined as a function of x. And I say, I'll say this, I'll say, we say y is a function of x. Provided each x is assigned or paired with only one y. And, and that's maybe too vague. And if I want to get maybe you know more understandable, that is there aren't two different points. that have the same x. And it's the, the x is a big deal here. The y doesn't make a difference. I didn't make any comment about points having the same y. So it's, it is OK. If two points have the same y, and by OK, I mean it doesn't keep the relation from, from being a function. So for each of the problems from 1 through 6 and I think 7 through 12, I'm either going to say yes or no for my answer. If I write yes, for my answer, that's going to mean y is a function of x, which will mean there's no two points having the same x. And if I write no for my answer, that's going to mean y is not a function of x. And that's going to happen when, when there are two points that have the same x. So I'm going to write no if there are two points with the same x. And I'm going to write yes if all points have different x's. So there's going to be no algebra. The problems will go really quickly. I just have to know what I'm looking for. So I have to understand that the question is essentially asking me to look at the sets of points and find the find out if there's duplication and or if there's x is used more than once or not. And I won't care at all if the points if y's are used more than once. That's not gonna keep me from answering yes or no. It's gonna have any impact on my answer. Only the x as well. 
So as I look at the first three problems that are even problems, 2, 4, and 6, when I look at problem 2, the x's are 6, 7, and 8. There aren't two points with the same x, so I'm going to write yes. And again, I could say, instead of writing yes, I can say y is a function of x. That's what I mean when I'm writing x, yes. But that takes a lot more to write. So the issue with having duplicate y's doesn't keep me from being able to say yes. Problem four, when I look at it, the x's I see are one and four, and those aren't the same number. So I'm going to say this is also, a, this relation also is a function of x, defines y as a function of x. But for problem six, I have two points that have the same x. So here I'm going to say no, and then parenthetically I could say, this is why when I'm saying no, I mean y is not a function of x. So you should be able to do problems 1, 3, and 5, and it shouldn't take a horrible long amount of time to do those. So if you wanted to pause the video, do problems 1, 3, and 5, check your answers, and then start the video up, and then I'll start doing problems 7 through 12, I believe. 7 through 12, when I get to those problems, uh, it kind of has the same instructions. I didn't blow up the instructions for some reason. But it says, you know, determine whether y is a function of x again. So it's the same question, but there's a little words to the left of the question that give you a hint on how to work the question or how to solve the question. So again, I'm trying to determine if y is a function of x. I'm going to say yes if no two points have the same x. I'm going to say no if there's two points with the same x. So here, for this group of problems from 7 through 12, I will write no for my answer, meaning y is not a function of x. if I can draw a vertical line that's parallel to the y-axis to touch the graph more than once. I will answer yes for, for my answer. If no, if I can't draw a vertical line to touch the graph in more than one place. So again, my answer is either going to be yes or no. And the technique for getting my yes and no answer is different, but not really. It's different, but it has the same reason. So for problem seven, I'm doing one of my rare odd problems because there wasn't an even problem that had a no answer. For problem seven, it's possible to draw a vertical line to touch the graph in more than one place so my answer is going to be no, or I can say, better yet, y is not a function of x, or y, does not def y is not defined as a function of x, because I can draw a vertical line to touch the graph in more than one place. If in, even though the test is different, the reason is the same. Because where this vertical line touches the graph, 
those are points that make up the relation. And if I look at the points here, this point appears to be the point 6, 2. This point down here appears to be the point 6, negative 2. These are both points that are on the relation. So if I was making a listing of points that make up the relation that's drawn in number 7, 6, 2 and 6, negative 2 would be in that listing, and those are points with the same x's. So it violates the, it, I write no for the same reason, that there's points in the relation that have the same x. I don't see the points, but a any place where a vertical line would touch the graph would give me two different points from the relation that have the same x. So for each of the problems, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, I'll scan the graph. If I can find a spot where I can draw a vertical line to touch the graph more than once, I'm going to write no for my answer. If I can't find a spot that I can draw a vertical line to touch the graph more than once, then I'm going to write yes. When I get to number 8, I'm going to write yes because I can't no matter what vertical line I draw, I don't think these will show up that well. That's okay. But no matter what vertical line I draw, I can't find a vertical line. I can't draw any line parallel to the y-axis that touches the graph more than once. Because I can't find a vertical line to touch the graph in more than one place, I'm going to write yes for my answer. And that yes again means y is a function of x. So I'll do um, 10 and 12. I don't think I printed out any more odd problems, but you should hopefully be able to do all the problems between 7 and 12 just by having me do these first two problems. I didn't say anything about horizontal lines, so when I go to do problem 10, I have to, for me to say no, that would mean I need to be able to draw a line that's parallel to the y-axis, and that line would have to touch the graph in more than one place. And I say nothing about horizontal lines. And no matter which line parallel to the y-axis I draw, they all only touch the graph in one place. So I'm going to say in this case, yes, that this is y is defined as a function of x, or y is a function of x. I snuck 11 in there because I just didn't have any no's in the evens. And 11 because it's super easy to draw a vertical line to touch the graph in more than one place. I'm going to write no for my answer. And it doesn't matter that I can draw a thousand vertical lines to touch the graph in more than one place. If I can at least do one, it's, that's, that's the key to me being able to write no for my answer. And the last problem in this grouping, it might be a little bit confusing about what's going on at the origin. But even at the origin, the vertical line that you draw is only supposed to touch the graph in one place. This answer is supposed to be a yes answer, but around the origin, it might look like that line touches the graph in more than one place. Uh, I wouldn't put a problem like this on the test because there's a little, maybe some confusion about, about how it's drawn, drawn there. But this is supposed to be a yes. But if you thought that this vertical line touched the graph in more than one place and you wrote no, I, I can see where you'd think that, and I wouldn't ding you for it, but that vertical line right there, the only one that's probably in doubt only, is supposed to touch the graph in more than one place. Um, if you took me for intermediate algebra, you might recognize these problems. Every one of these problems was a problem from my intermediate algebra class. I just cut and pasted some stuff from that class, and almost everything in this section, for that matter, is from oh, sec my chapter 3 in intermediate algebra. The next problems, 13 through 26, again, have the same question. The question that we had for problems 1 through 6, the question that we have from problems 7 through 12, and the question that 13 through 26 asks are all the same. Specifically, is y a function of x? My answer for each of the problems between 13 and 26 is either going to be yes or it's going to be no. There's ways to do these problems algebraically. But it's a lot easier to use my graphing calculator, and so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use my graphing calculator and the vertical line test to get my answer. So I, if an equation isn't solved for y, I'm going to solve it for y. 
if an equation is already solved for y, I'm going to break my calculator out, I'm going to sketch a graph, and then I'll see if that graph passes or fails the vertical line test. If I can draw a vertical line to touch the graph more than once, I'm going to write no. If not, I'm going to write yes. So um, I hit, I turned my calculator on, I hit my y equals button, there was some stuff up there, I hit clear. If any of these lines, plot one, plot two, or plot three, are darkened on your calculator, then you need to get them undarkened, or they're probably going to mess you up. I don't know how well this is showing up. So to get them undarkened, you hit second and y equals. This screen, if you, any of these plot one, plot two, plot three plots, if any of those say on, you have to hit enter on that and toggle the off, on switch to off. Anytime you have a on stat plot, which I can tell because one of these top things will be blacked out. Let me see if I can just do that on. If any of those are blacked out like that, that could cause really bad things to happen when you're graphing. So if you're having problems graphing and one of these plots is blackened, you need to unblacken it. You unblacken it by hitting second stat plot, hitting enter on the plot that's on, right arrowing over to off, and then you could hit second and quit, and then you're good to go. So I'm going to graph problem 14. I'm going to hit the X key, the squared key above the log button, and then plus 4. I don't know what window I was using previously, so I'm going to hit the zoom button, go down to option 6 that says standard, and this window will work fine for every graph in this section. It's just a nice parabola. You actually graph parabolas in intermediate algebra, so you might have known that already. So this is what the graph looks like, more or less. And then the question is, does that, can I draw a vertical line to touch the graph in more than one place? Because that answer is no, we'll say yes, this is, or y is defined as a function of x. So my answer for 14 is going to be yes. Again, that yes means y is a function of x. Meaning there aren't two points that have the same x. 16, the graph might be a little bit harder to tell what's going on. I'll do the same thing though. I'm going to hit y equals, clear out the function that's in there by hitting my clear button, type 5, divide it by, hit the x key. Now my window is probably okay. I'm going to hit my graph button and I get a graph that looks like this, more or less. For you to be able to write no for an answer, then you physically need to be able to draw a vertical line parallel to the y-axis and have that vertical line touch the graph more than once. And when I look at my graph that I copied, there for me, I can't find a place where I can draw a line parallel to the y-axis that touches the graph more than once. Because I can't find a vertical line that I can touch the graph in more than one place, I'm going to write yes, y is a function of x. Do the same thing for 18. I'm going to hit my... It's going to big glare on this. I'm not sure how to... That's better. Hit my y equals button. Clear the function that's in there. For square root, I hit second and x squared. So I go second and x squared. Well, second and x squared. And then I want x minus 2. It's the minus above the plus sign and below the time sign. I close my parentheses. I hit graph. My calculator gives me a graph that looks something like that. For me to be able to write no for an answer, I would be able, I'd have to be able to draw a vertical line to touch the graph in more than one place. Since I can't find a place to draw a vertical line that can touch the graph in more than one place, I'm going to write yes for my answer. Twenty to graph a cube root is going to be a little bit trickier, but I can still do it. So for twenty, I'm going to hit my y equals button. I'm going to clear out what's there. The cube root is hidden on these calculators. To get the cube root activated, you have to hit the math key. That's in the left-hand column here. And when you hit the math key, go down to option four. That'll get you the cube root. And then I'm going to type x and then the minus below the times key and then minus 5 and then graph. My 
calculator gives me a graph that looks something like that. This is another yes. Because I can't draw a vertical line to touch the graph in more than one place. What the first bunch of problems in this grouping had in common is they were all solved for y. The fact that they were solved for y made them real easy to solve on my graphing calculator. The next few problems that aren't solved for y, if I want to use my graphing calculator, I need to solve them for y. 22 is a circle, and you might be able to graph it because you remember how to graph circles from the last chapter. But I'm going to just do the algebra here to solve this for y. So I could use my calculator. Because my calculator can't graph this equation because it has to be solved for y. So I'm going to solve for y. First thing I'm going to do is subtract x minus 2 quantity squared from both sides. When I do that, I get y squared on the left side and 16 minus x minus 2 quantity squared on the right side. I could write the, the minus x minus 2 quantity squared first, but it's just as easy to write it second. And I'm going to solve with square roots. I'm going to go square root plus or minus square root because anytime I introduce a square root into a problem that has an equal sign, I need a plus or minus. On the left-hand side, the square rooting crosses out the square. You can't cross it out on the right-hand side because of the minus between the 16 and the x minus 2 quantity squared. And in order to graph this, I need to graph two functions. I'm going to graph y1 for the positive square root of 16 minus the quantity x minus 2 squared. And I'm going to make a y2 for the minus 16 minus 6 the square root of 16 minus x minus 2 squared. And when I graph this, it's going to graph to be a circle. But you should have known that ahead of time if you remembered something from the last chapter. So I'm going to hit y equals, clear out what's in there, type, and then I'm going to go second square root of 16 minus parentheses x minus 2 quantity squared. Probably need one more parentheses. And then the negative in the bottom row of the calculator in front of the next square root, and then second square root, 16, and then the minus below the time sign, x minus 2 quantity squared, close out my parentheses. If you start getting errors and your graphs don't start looking like mine, one of the common mistakes is using the wrong minus. If I have a minus that's written first in, in an expression or a problem, that's usually the minus in the bottom of the calculator. If I have a negative sign between two pieces, that's usually the minus below the time sign above the plus sign. Now when I hit graph, this is going to give me my circle. And it may not look exactly like a circle, but it's okay. for our purposes, it doesn't need to be that accurate. So that's more or less the picture my calculator gave me when I did this. And my answer is going to be no, because it's going to be possible to draw a vertical line to touch the graph in more than one place. So my answer for 22 is going to be no. And again, that no means y is not a function of x, or y is not defined as a function of x. Usually, if you have a y squared, your answer is going to be no. If you don't have a y squared, then your answer is going to be yes for these style of problems. 24 kind of bugs me that the y squared is on the right side. I'm going to rewrite 24 as y squared equals x plus 2. I still can't graph this even by doing that because it's not solved for y itself for y squared. So I'm going to go square root plus or minus square root. On the left hand side, squaring, square rooting cancels out a square. On the right-hand side, I can't simplify because there isn't a single quantity squared. And when I go to use my calculator, I'm going to have to do this in two pieces. One for the positive square root of x plus 2. Another for the negative square root of x plus 2. And immediately when I have to do that, I'm going to get uh, bad things. I'm going to get a no for an answer. So I'm going to turn my get my calculator going again, clear out the functions that are in there, do a square root of x plus 2, 
and a negative square root of x plus 2, graph it, and I get a parabola facing on the side. It's not a circle because the x isn't squared. That keeps it from being a circle. But it looks something like this. I mean, it doesn't have to be that accurate, but I draw here. That's accurate enough. If you look at that compared to mine, it's vaguely the same shape. It's enough the same shape that I know the answer is no, because it's possible for me to draw a vertical line to touch the graph in more than one place. So we say no. Again, that means y is not a function of x. One last one of these problems. This isn't a circle. It's actually an ellipse. And I can't graph it on my calculator because it's not solved for y. If I wanted to roll the dice, my answer is more than likely going to be no. The y squared generally makes it so when I use my calculator, I have to graph a y1 and a y2. And when I have to do that, that usually makes it fail the vertical line test. So I'm starting the algebra to solve for y. I minus 5x squared from both sides. I wrote the 5x squared after the 25. You could write it to the left of the 25. It doesn't matter. Now I'm dividing everything by 3. So I get y squared equals 25 over 3 minus 5 over 3x squared. And now I'm going to go square root plus or minus square root. On the left-hand side, I get y. On the right-hand side, that doesn't reduce at all. I could write it differently, but because I'm just going to graph it, there's no sense in cleaning up that right-hand side. I could do lots of algebra to write the right-hand side better, but none of it would be that helpful. So when I go to my calculator, I'm going to type a y1 equal to the positive square root of 25 over 3. And I'm going to type that as 25 over 3. And then minus, and then I'm going to go 5 divided by 3x squared. And I'll do y2 with the minus of that. And here I'm actually trying to show you what I'm physically going to type in on my calculator. Because my calculator, I need division for fractions. And that 5 thirds, if it's not in a parentheses, it might not think the x is in the numerator, or it might think the x is in the denominator. So I'm going to enter those two functions the best I can. Hit my y equals, clear and clear. And then second square root of 25 divided by 3 minus parentheses, 5 divided by 3 x squared. Close out my parentheses, and then do the one with the minus, and go minus second square root. 25 divided by 3 minus parentheses 5 divided by 3 x hit the squared key close my parentheses and so that's essentially what I said I was going to type in I typed it in I'm going to graph it and my calculator gives me uh, something that looks disconnected this is because my calculator is slightly flawed it doesn't maybe have enough pixel resolution to connect what it should connect the graph should really looks more like this than what the what it gives me. Um, it's not it's supposed to be more of a football shape than it is circle, although it looks more like a circle here. And these little the ends aren't supposed to be disconnected. But for our purposes, it's gonna fail the vertical line test and I'm gonna write no, even if I didn't understand my calculator was kind of selling me a little bit short. So the answer for 26 is going to be no, y is not defined as a function of x. And again, if you look at all the problems that we did algebra for, if they were already solved for y, the answer wound up being yes, y is a function of x. If they weren't solved for y and they had a y squared, the process of solving for y squared involves doing a plus or minus, and that makes me have the answer of no. That plus or minus is going to make the graph fail the vertical line test. All right, so again, more problems from my intermediate algebra class. That last group of problems I don't think was in inter my intermediate algebra, that set of algebra problems. For um, the next group of problems, 27 through 45, I'm given 
either functions written as sets of points or functions drawn as graphs. They're all functions because there's no duplicate x's. And I'm asked to write the domain in the range. And the domain of a function will just be a list. Well, the domain, we usually say it's all the x coordinate of every point in a function. And the range of a function is going to be the y coordinate of all the points. In my pictures, if, if, well, let me just start doing the problems and then I'll, I'll talk about what happens uh, when I get into the graphs that get slightly more complicated. So the first few problems I see uh, are even problems that aren't graphs, problems 28 and 30. I'm asked to find the domain. Those are functions, both 28 and 30. The equation or the function that's written is a function because there's no duplication in the x's. I'm going to con continue with this notation. For the domain and range of G, because G is defined as a set, I'm going to use set notation to write my domain and range answers. And I'm not very good at drawing that. I'm trying to emulate that squiggly, but I don't, didn't do it very well. The domain for 28 would just be the x coordinate of each of the individual points. In that case, I'm going to write 3, 5, 9, and 8. If it bugged you that I didn't write 3, 5, 8, 9, it's correct to write them in any order that you want. As long as your domain has the numbers 3, 5, 9, and 8, you could write 9, 8, 5, 3, you could write 3, 5, 8, 9. There are a bunch of different orders that you can write them in, but the order is irrelevant when a function is defined as a set of points. When you write the domain, which is all the x's, the order is not important. Similarly, when I go to write the range, I'm writing the y-coordinates of the points. And you might get a teacher take points off if you just wrote what I wrote, because it's not necessary to duplicate the y's that are duplicated. So when I went to write my answer for range, I didn't take the time to write the numbers in ascending order, which wasn't a bad thing. I wrote the ones that came in two points twice. That's probably not the best way to do it. So I wouldn't take points off. It's not wrong, but it's writing more than you want, and that's not being efficient. So probably the nicest answer would be to take the time to write the y coordinates in ascending order just because it makes it easier for a reader and not to duplicate the ones that are duplicated. But if you wrote the y's just in the order that they came and you wrote the duplicates down, that's not wrong. So the domain of a function written as a, as a set of points would be the x coordinates of all the points. The range would be the y coordinates. There's no algebra to do. Similarly, problem 30, there's going to be no algebra to do as well. There's only two points. The domain is going to be the x coordinate of the points, which is going to be 0 and negative 1. And the range is going to be the y coordinates of the points, which are 3 and 5. Because the functions were written in set notation, writing my answer in set notation may just seem like the thing to do. Problem 32 is a function that's drawn as a graph, but the points aren't connected. I'm going to do 32 just like it was 28 and 30. Uh, 28 was a function that had four points. 30 is a function. 32 is a function that have, has four points. And I'm going to do the domain and range for it just like I did the domain and range for the last problems. So the thing that makes the three problems on these this page these three problems the same, is they all only have a few points. 28 only has four points, 30 only has two points, 32 only has four points. And when a, a function is has a finite number of points, then I write the domain by listing all the x's, write the range by listing all the y's. So to do the domain, I need all the x's. The x's are negative three. Well, this is not even a function. Oh, this is a relation that's not a function, but I still can well, I'm going to write the domain of this. 
although usually we restrict the question to whether to find the domain of something to, to if it's a function or not. But so this is not even a function. I should change it, but I'm not going to. So this is going to, I'm going to write the point negative 3, 1, and positive 3. I'm not duplicating the 1, although it wouldn't be wrong to. When I go to do the range, I'm going to write negative 2, negative 3, positive 2, and positive 4, which are the y coordinates of the points. And which makes this graph problem unique from the rest of the graph problems is that the points aren't connected. The fact that the points aren't connected, these are the only points on the graph. It would be wrong to connect these points. And it would be wrong to write the answer using intervals, which I'm going to start doing here in a second. So which makes the three problems on this page like is they have a finite number of points. 28 has four points, 30 has two points, 32 has four points. Did bad things with my numbering on this next page. Magically did another problem 32, so I just said second 32. If I renumbered it, then I'd have to renumber everything after it, and I've already written the, the key, and it was just going to be a mess, and I didn't want to delete the problem. So um, this problem is different. If you wrote this, this would be a wrong answer for the domain. It'd be wrong if you said the domain is the points 0, 3, and 5. Because that would imply that the graph only consists of three points, which is not the case because the points are connected. Any point that lies on the graph is a point, and that x would need to be part of the, the domain. For instance, this point right here looks like the point 2, 2. Even though I didn't label it, that it's still a point on the graph, so 2 would need to be part of my domain. And worse than that, even the fractions are in there. Like this point right here might be the point something like, I don't know, 1.8 comma, not that that's readable, 1.8 comma, I'll call that maybe 4.75. So that also, 1.8 would also need to be part of my domain. When a graph has the points connected, it has infinitely many points as opposed to just three points. So this graph has too many points. It actually has infinitely many points because any place I can draw a dot, I'm not sure I just spelled that right. I should write really sloppily, infinitely many points. And it's impossible to list all the x coordinates of the points because there's infinitely many of them. You can't write the domain like that because there would be infinitely many numbers. Any number that, that between 0 and 5 essentially that you give me, I could find a point on the graph with that has that as x coordinate. So when graphs are connected, When the points on a graph are connected, are connected, we use interval notation. points that I gave are kind of the bare minimum points I could have listed on this graph to make it possible to write the domain in the range. 
and very specifically for each of the problems that have the points being connected, to write the domain, I'm going to do this. I'm going to write an interval, and it's generally going to have rectangular brackets at the end unless the graph doesn't doesn't end. If the graph goes on forever, this rectangular bracket's going to change, which I'll talk about in a second. For the domain answer for each of the problems coming up, I'm going to do this. I'm going to write an interval notation. And that interval is going to contain two numbers separated by a comma and square brackets. And very specifically, for this problem and the next few problems, because the domain, because there's infinitely many points, and the domain would have infinitely many x's to write, I'm going to find the domain by finding the most left point on the graph. And I'm going to find the far right point on the graph. And for the domain, I'm going to put the x-coordinates of those two points separated by a comma and square brackets. So for problem, the second problem, 32, the correct domain is going to be 0, comma, 5, because 0 is the x-coordinate of the far left point. 5 is the x-coordinate of the far right point. Square brackets imply that those points are part of the graph. And it would be wrong to write 0, 3, 5 because writing 0, 3, 5 would imply that the only points that are on the graph are the three, those three, 0, 10, 3, 1, and 5, 5, and that's not the case. Similarly, it would be wrong if for the range I wrote 10, 1, and 5 in any order, because that would imply the graph only has three points, but the graph actually has infinitely many points. Any place I can draw a dot on this graph is a point that has both an x and a y and a coordinate. The y coordinate that relates to the point described by that dot would need to be in my listing. So that would be wrong to write that. When I go, when graphs are connected and I, I attempt to write the range, I do this. So when graphs are connected, points on the graph are connected, the range I'm going to write from, again, I need y coordinates as opposed to x's. I'm going to write first a square bracket, and then I'm going to write the y coordinate of the bottom point, and then a comma, and then the y coordinate of the top point. And I'll finish up my square brackets. And that's most of the problems coming up. Um, there's going to be some slight variations as we get deeper into the problems, but this sort of feel is going to work fine for the graphs that the points are connected. So for the, this particular problem, if I wanted to, to do the range correctly, I need to find the bottom point. The point 3, 1 is at the bottom of this graph. I need its y to be part of my range. So the first thing I'm going to do for my range is write a square bracket. I find the bottom point on the graph, which is the point 3, 1. I take its y coordinate. And then I find the top point on the graph, which is the point 0, 10, comma, and put its y coordinate. So for this problem, the second problem, 32, the correct domain is close square brackets 0, comma, 5. And for the range, it's square brackets 1, comma, 10. 34, I have a distractor point marked, but it's not a bad thing. What 34 has in common from 32, even though the shape of the graph is different, is there's only three points labeled, and the graph has periods at the end. So when the graph has the points connected, my domain and my range are only going to show two numbers, and I'm going to use interval notation to write my answer. Just like the problem 32, I write a couple of square brackets separated by a comma. I need to get the x-coordinate of the far left point.
and the x coordinate of the most right point to get the correct answer for my domain. So for problem 34, the domain is going to be negative 1, comma 2 because the point that's furthest left, the point negative 1, negative 2, has an x coordinate of negative 1. The point that's most right, 2, 4, has an x coordinate of 4. To do the range, I need the bottom and the top point, and I need their y's. The bottom point on this graph is the point negative 1, negative 2. The top point is the point 2, 4, that 0, 0 that's in the middle. It's not a left, a right, a top, or a bottom. It's a distractor point that's not even going to show up in my answer for the domain I'm a range. So my range, I take the y coordinate of the bottom point, which is negative 2, comma the y coordinate of the top point, which is 4. So what problems kind of 32, 33, 34, and probably 35 have in common is the points that are listed in the graph are connected, so my graphs need to be in interval notation. The endpoints have periods, so the graph stops right where it's, it's drawn to stop. The next few problems, 36 and 38 and 40, and the odd problems that correspond, they're slightly different. The big difference is the ends of the graphs aren't marked with points. And if an end isn't marked with a point, then the graph is supposed to be extended in the direction that it's going. And it's not supposed to stop. So for problem 36, this graph, it's drawn to stop just because the paper has to stop at some point. But it's implied that the graph goes up and to the left forever and up and to the right forever. And I need to extend any graph, any edge of a graph that doesn't have a period on it to some sort of infinities. And real specifically, I need to know the infinities on my axes. The far, the far edge, right edge of the x-axis is the positive infinity in the x-direction. The left edge of the x-axis is the bottom, or is the negative infinity in the x-direction. The top of the y-axis, that's the positive y-direction, goes to positive infinity, and the bottom of the y-axis goes to minus infinity. So I have to understand that the x and the y-axis, they go all the way vertically or horizontally out to positive and negative infinity. This graph is going to get extended. And when I extend it this direction, it goes all the way to the right, which is the positive x direction. And it goes all the way up, which is the positive y direction. So although it doesn't ever get there, it's, it's, it's eventually going towards positive, positive infinity off to the right. And off to the left, when I go to extend this graph, it goes all the way up, which is to the top of the y-axis, which is the positive y-axis direction. And eventually, it goes all the way off to the left edge of the x-axis, which is the negative x direction. So what this is going to is negative positive infinity. If I just label these quadrants, this quadrant, if something winds up going to the top of this quadrant, this is the negative positive quadrant. That's quadrant 2. Quadrant 1 is both infinities are positive. Quadrant 4, the x is positive, the y is negative, and in quadrant 3, they're both negative. So um, the next few problems, I'm going to need to extend my graphs. If it extends into the second quadrant, I'm going to write negative positive infinity. If it extends into the first quadrant, double positive. If it extends into the fourth quadrant, positive negative, and into the third quadrant, double negative. So now that I've extended my graph, I, ha I have the graph that I could use to find the domain and the range. So real specifically, this graph that was given to me wasn't quite what I needed to find the domain and the range. If I would have given you this graph, it would have been nicer, but I didn't. So the only point that, that was marked was the point 2, 1. I added to these graphs a right end, end, which is positive, positive infinity, and a left end, which is negative, whoops, yeah, negative, positive infinity. This is the graph I'm going to use to find the domain and the range of. When I have infinities, I'm going to put a round parentheses because the graph never actually gets there. As opposed to the square. So to do this particular problem, now that I've extended the graph in the directions it needed to be extended, I'm going to try to attack the domain. I'm going to fire the far left point, 
and it's x. I'm going to find the far right point, and it's x. I'm going to write that for my domain. And infinities, I'm going to put round brackets. If you put a square bracket, I wouldn't take a point off, but it's not technically right because that point isn't really on the graph. The graph just goes forever without stopping. So I didn't use the point 2, 1 yet, but I'm going to use the point 2, 1, 2, 1 here in a second to do the range. For the range, I need, oh, that's 2, comma 1. <laughs> For the range, I need the y coordinate of the bottom point which is going to be 1. I'm going to write that first. Because it's a point on the graph, it gets a square bracket. And then I need the top points. And the points that I extended are both equally high. They're both considered top points. But it's not really a conflict because they both have the same y's. So I'm going to write 1 comma infinity. And infinities get round brackets. So again, for the domain, I extended the graph. I found the far left and the far right points separated those infinities with a comma. Infinities will always get round brackets. For the range, I found the bottom and the top point, and I wrote their y's. Infinities get round brackets. Points on the graph get square brackets. 38 only needs to be extended in one direction because the right edge is perioded for me. So I'm not going to extend it to the right. I'm going to extend it down and to the left. And, oh, where is that drawing that I made? And that extension that I'm going to get, make, make happen, is going to go to a um, double negative infinity. I've already lost what I'm looking for. Nothing really matters. So, oh, that's right, right on top of me. Duh. So I need to extend this graph this way, and that's going to extend here. It's all the way to the left and all the way down. So this graph, the left edge didn't have a period on it. I needed to extend the left, and that's in the third quadrant, so it goes to a double infinity. And now I'm going to write my domain in my range. Because the points are connected, I'm using interval notation. For the domain, I need the far left point and its x-coordinate, and then the far right point and its x-coordinate. So for this particular problem, the far left coordinate has a negative infinity for its x, the far right coordinate has a 2 for its x. I'm going to put the infinity in a round parentheses, the 2 because it's physically a point on the graph, in a square parentheses, and write the domain as negative infinity to 2. For the range, I need to identify the bottom and the top point and their y's. So for my range, I'm going to write negative infinity, comma, 0. So this these infinities are a big deal. So if the graph is going to the bottom left, it's double negative infinity. To the top left, it's negative positive infinity. Top right, double positive. Bottom right, positive negative infinity. So when I'm going to extend my graphs, I need to know what points they extend to, and those are going to be important to know. So there's the answer for problem 38. 40 is the last problem that kind of fits the, the mold that I'm looking for, where I'm just going to extend the graph. 40, you can probably really read this, 3, 1. The left and the right edge both need to be extended. This is going to extend to the positive negative infinity. If you looked at that grid that I just showed, again, you'd get that. And this one here is the double negative. For the domain, I read left to right. And I find the x-coordinate of the far left point and the x-coordinate of the far right point. And it would be proper for this problem to say the domain is negative to positive infinity. That's the x-coordinate of the left and the right point. Infinities get round brackets. And then for the range, I need the bottom and the top point. It's, it doesn't matter if you think this point is lower than the other one or if you think these are tied for lowness, they both eventually go all the way down to the bottom. They both have the same y. The first number I'm going to write in my range is negative infinity, because that's the y-coordinate of the bottom point. It doesn't matter which one of these you consider the bottom. They both have the same bottom. And then the top y is going to be this one. So for my range, I'm going to write negative infinity, comma 1. 
every one of those problems is from my intermediate algebra handout. There's nothing that, if you took intermediate algebra, should be new. Hopefully, hopefully those went quickly. The next few problems are the graphs of fractions. And I usually attack the graphs of fractions domains uh, differently. You'll notice that 42, the graph has kind of two distinct halves, a left half which looks bigger than the right half, and then a right half, well, if I extended the graph, they'd be the same size. But, but anyways, it has two halves. And if I look at this, this graph vertically, it has a break right here. The graph exists everywhere to the left of that line and everywhere to the right of that line. It would be a really nice answer, but not maybe the answer that's wanted here. One, two, three, four, five. This is, this is a candidate for this for an answer. The domain is all real numbers. Except five. Except five, or except x equal to five. Because the graph exists everywhere to the left of the vertical line that goes through five, and everywhere to the right of the vertical line that goes through five. This is a correct domain answer. Normally, I get the domain of fraction graphs, which are usually broken graphs, differently than I do the graphs of uh, non fractions. This would be an acceptable answer to me for those of you going on to brief calculus or regular calculus to write to exclude a number from the domain. You do it like this. This is the probably the desired answer for problem 42. To write every number but five, you do this. You make two intervals with all round brackets separated by a union symbol. Round brackets exclude a number, so at the right edge of the first parentheses and the left edge of the second parentheses separated by the union or the or symbol. If I write round parentheses with a five, this is a mathematically elegant way to exclude five from the domain. I want to include every number bigger than five, so I want to go from five to infinity. I want to include every number less than five, which is all the way down to negative infinity. So this would be the elegant way to say that this graph exists everywhere to the left of 5 and to the right of 5, but doesn't exist at 5. It has the exact same meaning as this. If you wrote this down on a test for this graph, I'd give you full credit. That's probably what my key might say, but this is the interval way to write it, just to be consistent with how I'm writing problems before. If I looked at 42 this way, it has another break. And that break is less obvious because the graph looks like it actually touches the um, y-axis, but it doesn't. This graph is supposed to have a break, and it's supposed to be at 0 on the y-axis. And when I go to write the range, the graph exists everywhere above 0 and everywhere below 0 on the y-axis. It doesn't actually supposed, not as not actually supposed to touch the 0, and it would be nice or a proper thing to say, the range is all real numbers. Except zero, because if I draw a horizontal line through zero on the y-axis, it, it's the only line that will miss the graph. This would be a correct answer for the range. Notice I'm not doing it at all like the other problems. And the way uh, an author might write the answer is similar. If I want to exclude a number from the range, I'm going to create two uh, intervals, one for the top half, one for the bottom half. I'm excluding 0 by putting 0 at the end of the first interval. At the beginning of the second interval, I'm doing nothing but round parentheses. I want to include the top half of the graph, which is from 0 to positive infinity, the top of the y-axis, and the bottom of the graph, which is from the bottom of the y-axis, which is negative infinity to 0. So these are the correct answers, the nicest, most elegant answers for the domain in the range. These are correct, but not maybe written as nice as maybe a, a calculus teacher might see it. So for problems, the b bottom few problems where the graphs are broken, those are actually the graphs of fractions. Generally, the domain for a fraction is all real numbers except. Similarly, often the range is all real numbers except. And to get those excepts, I need to find out where the breaks in the graphs are. Those breaks will show up in my answers in interval notation as well. 44, it's supposed to be another graph of a fraction. 
in terms of the domain, it has a break right here. And that's one that's at negative four. So the graph exists everywhere to the left and the right of negative four. It would be correct to say the domain is all real numbers. except negative 4, or except x equal to negative 4. I, um, because you might be going higher, you should be able to do it like this. Usually the domains of fractions written in interval notations have two intervals separated by a union symbol. The number that you're excluding from the domain goes at the left edge of the second parentheses and the right edge of the first parentheses, and then you get the infinities in the other ones. So any, anything to the left of negative 4 or to the right of negative 4 is part of the domain. Both of these, for my purposes, would be OK. The range, I tried to make this a little bit tricky. The range, this graph, I'm not sh exactly sure um, where, this graph, where this graph has a break. I, I tried to make it so it had a break. At, a, at a, a fraction, and I think this graph actually has a break at one half on the y that exists below. If I if I made one half on the y axis, the graph exists everywhere below one half and above one half, and it doesn't exist at one half. It, in calculus, you'll learn how to find what that number is um, using calculus. But since it's not a calculus class, we can hardly make you use calculus, and I couldn't do calculus without an equation, anyways. So for the range, I'm, this, is, this is a fudge here that I think this graph exists everywhere except one, one half. And whatever, wherever you think this, this break is, if you thought this break was at one, you said the graph existed everywhere above one and everywhere below one, but not at one, that would be OK too. But if you wrote the range as all real numbers except, and you wrote something, that's a number, you know, somewhere between one half and one, wherever you thought the horizontal break was, that would be OK. And then if you want to do a nice answer, you'd write negative infinity comma negative one half, union of oh, positive one half, should I say, and then positive one half comma infinity. So for the last few problems that are graphs of fractions, you have, um, you do the domains and ranges a little bit differently. OK, the last group of problems is finding the domain using algebra. And there are going to be three kinds of problems that we're going to do. And they're all review. So for problems 46 through 67, to find the domain of a square root, will be one of the three types of problems. What I do to do this is I take the radicand, which is the number under the, the, the expression under the square root, and set it greater than or equal to 0. My answer is usually x greater than or equal to some number, which can be written our, as an interval, usually a square bracket, some number, comma, infinity. I say the word usually because sometimes my answers have less than's in them. So in the next group of problems, there's a handful of problems that have square roots that we're going to be asked to find the domain for. And finding the domain of a problem with a square root you take what's under the square root and set it greater than or equal to 0. This is because if I plug a value in for x and it gives me a number that's less than 0, I get an i, and that won't show up on the domain. The second style of problem that we're going to be asked to find the domain of is the domain of a fraction. And the algebra to find the domain of the fraction is I'm going to ignore the numerator. I'm going to solve the denominator equal to 0. 
And then my answer can usually be written is the domain is all real numbers and then accept and then some number or in intervals it's usually negative infinity comma some number union that number comma infinity and again this is usually because I can definitely make fraction problems that have domains that are slightly less uh, slightly more complicated similarly I can make square roots domains have less sins in them um, so these but but in the algebra parts solid to find the domain if there's a square root I take what's under the square root set it greater than zero that's gonna help me get my answer greater than or equal to zero for the fraction I'm gonna ignore the numerator set the denominator equal to zero that's the algebra part of what I'm gonna do and then how I write my answer might vary depending on the complexity of the problem and then the other style of problems that I'm gonna get are polynomials and for our purposes in this particular section of problems the polynomial will have no square root I'll have no fraction and the domain for them won't have any algebra it's going to be negative to positive infinity So there's three kind of problems embedded in the next few problems. And some of the problems actually have both square roots and fractions. So immediately when I get to the next group of problems, I look to see, does the problem have a square root? Does it have a fraction? If it has a square root or a fraction, there's going to be algebra to do to find my domain. If it doesn't have a square root and it doesn't have a fraction, there's no algebra required. If I do any algebra, the algebra will likely find the x-intercept, which has nothing to do with the domain. Okay, so getting into the section or the grouping of problems, problem 46 wants me to find the domain of a square root. To find the domain of a square root, I take the radicand, that's the thing that's under the radical, set it greater than or equal to zero. So for all square roots, the computation to find the domain is to set the radical, the underside of the radical, greater than or equal to zero. Really minimal algebra here. This would be correct for an answer for the domain. The domain of this is going to be x is greater than or equal to 2. The instructions say to write my answer in interval notation. The interval notation that represents x is greater than or equal to 2 is 2 to infinity. Notice I don't say find the range. Finding the range is more of a calculus problem when you're having um, intervals or equations. Let me just graph this just to show you what it looks like. My calculator doesn't do the ultimate best job of graphing um, square roots, but I can kind of show you why the, calcul why the domain is what it is. So I'm graphing the square root of x minus 2, and when I hit graph, I can see it perfectly, actually. The graph exists to the right of 2. It exists. That, that's the point two zero right there. The graph exists to the right of 2, but not to the left of 2. So, this, so this, the graph that really corresponds to this would be this picture, 2 comma 0. And I need to extend this graph to the double infinity. And the x-coordinate of the far left point is 2. The y-coordinate of the far left well, at the x coordinate of the far right point is infinity. This is why we say the domain is 2 to infinity. All square roots, you can draw a picture. If you get a reasonable picture, you can get the domain from them. 48 is also a square root. Square roots, I find the domain by just taking what's under the radical, and I set it greater than or equal to 0. Do the algebra to solve for that. I minus 12 from both sides here. This gives me 3x is greater than or equal to negative 12. Divide both sides by 3. Gives me x is greater than or equal to negative 4. It wouldn't be wrong to say the domain is x is greater than or equal to negative 4. Because the instructions say write the domain as an interval, that's the better version of the domain. 
which means when I go to, if I wanted to do this via my calculator and I sketched a graph, I did y equals clear second square root of 3x plus 12. When I hit my graph, which looks something like this, has a starting point of negative 4 comma 0, needs to be extended to the double infinity. The x-coordinate of the far left point is negative 4. The x-coordinate of the far right point is infinity. So that's how the, the graphs kind of match up to the, to the algebra. So I could technically just graph it to find the domain, but the algebra is, is probably something you should be able to do. 50 is a fraction. To find the domain of a fraction, I ignore the numerator. I solve the denominator equal to 0. If I stop there, that's not good. I can do one of two things. I can write my answer in words. Which is all real numbers except 3. Or I can write the interval notation of that, and that you get by taking a 3, putting it between a union symbol and round parentheses, and that means this graph exists everywhere to the right and to the left of 3. I think this calculator will do a decent job graphing this. If I do this parentheses x plus 2, divide it by parentheses x minus 3, and hit graph, what you get right here is a graph that exists, and this is 3. It exists everywhere to the right of 3 and exists everywhere to the left of 3, but it doesn't exist through the vertical line that goes through 3 on the x-axis, and that's why we say the domain is, is what it is. And notice the algebra for the domain for a fraction doesn't give me the answer. It gives me something that can be transformed into the answer, whereas the algebra for the domain of a square root actually gives me what the domain is. So it's a little bit trickier to do the domain of a fraction. But you've done all these before in intermediate algebra. 52, it's a fraction. To find the domain of a fraction, I ignore the numerator. I solve the denominator equal to 0. And in this case, the denominator has a square. So when I go to find the domain, actually I'm finding the numbers to exclude from the domain when I'm doing the algebra, I set the denominator equal to 0. Because the denominator has a square, I factor. I'm going to get two breaks in this graph. Once I have it factored and I set the factors equal to 0, I, this, when I go to graph this, it's going to have two breaks. It would be correct to write this for an answer. I'd be content with this. Because the instructions ask for interval notation, to, ex exchange, to exclude two numbers from the domain, I'm going to need three intervals. You always need one more interval than numbers that you're excluding. Two intervals next to each other with negative sevens in round parentheses will exclude the negative seven. Two intervals with ones in round parentheses at the beginning and the end will exclude the ones. And I need infinity at the far right end, negative infinity at the far left end. This is the interval notation. I'm completely content with the sentence. When I go to graph this on my calculator, there should be two breaks in the graph. There should be a break at negative 7 and a break at 1. So if I did y equals clear 2 divided by parentheses x squared plus 6x minus 7, and I hit graph, my first, my, graph, my calculator has a break at negative 7, and it has a break at positive 1. And you can kind of see the breaks, and that's why we say the graph exists everywhere ex except at x equals negative 7 and at x equal to 1. So both of these answers say the same thing. This, for me, it makes, I, I look at it and I understand negative 7 and 1 is where the graph is going to have its breaks. There, that's a little more abstract, but it means the same thing to a mathematician. 54 is a combined problem, has a fraction and it has a square root. So I need to do two things. I'm going to find the domain because it's a fraction. I need the number to exclude.
because when you're doing the, a fraction, the algebra gives you the number to exclude from the domain. I get the number to exclude from a domain by setting the denominator equal to zero. So this is the fraction part. Because it's a fraction, I need a number to exclude from the domain. I get that by setting the denominator equal to zero. The denominator has a square root. I'm going to square both sides. When I square, I don't introduce a, a plus or minus. It's only when I square root. When you square a square root, it cancels out the square root. I get x minus 3 equal to 0. When I add 3 to both sides, I get x equal to 3. 3 needs to be excluded from the domain. So the fraction part says 3 can't be part of the domain answer. And now there's also a square root. So I'm doing both things in one. I'm doing both a fraction and a square root together. To find the domain of the square root, if this any problem that has a square root, to find the domain of the square root, you take the underside of the square root, set it greater than or equal to 0, even though that square root's in the denominator. I'd still do this process. The square root says, if the problem was just the square root, the, the domain would be x is any number bigger than or equal to 3. The, domain, the fraction says x can't be 3, because if I plug, the gra graph's going to have a break at 3. And to combine the square root and the fraction answer together, the fraction says you, can't, you have to exclude 3. And the square root says I can have any number 3 or bigger, including the 3. The, the, the fraction cancels out the 3. The, the or equal to part, and the domain for this combined problem, and I'm not going to be able to show it that nicely on a graph because my calculator is just not good enough to do that, would be this. x is greater than 3. It's going to be the whole domain of the square root throwing out any numbers the, frac the square root being in the denominator causes you to throw out, which is the 3. So this would be a correct answer, or all round brackets. Notice I don't get the union symbol. The square root makes it so I, could, I can't have numbers less than 3. When I go to graph this, I'm not going to see probably this round. Well, maybe I will see it. Let me do this. Uh, y equals clear than 2 divided by second square root of x minus 3. When I go to hit my graph button, it, it does kind of OK. The graph looks like this is 3 on the x-axis. And it does this. It really probably should do this. But my calculator doesn't have enough resolution to show this. And wh what this is supposed to show is the graph doesn't exist at 3, but it exists everywhere to the right of 3. This is why I only have one interval in my answer, because the graph doesn't exist to the left of 3. The square root keeps it from it existing to the left of 3, because it only lets numbers bigger than 3 be included. So it's a fraction problem with a twist, because usually in fraction problems, you have two intervals separated by a union, but in square root problems, we usually only have one interval. The square root ran one out over the fraction and put it down to one interval. I would doubt that I would put something like that on a test, but I felt kind of obliged just to show you that you could have more complex problems that can be integrated together. 56 is good because it's a square root problem, but it's not going to have a greater than. So to find the domain of any square root, I take the radical, set it greater than or equal to 0. I like with radicals to have the x on the left side. So when I solve this, I'm going to minus 5 from both sides. So I get minus x is greater than or equal to minus 5. And now I need to divide both sides by a negative 1. When you divide by a negative, you need to switch the direction of the inequality. So I'm going to make the greater than into a left less than. This is going to give me x is less than or equal to positive 5. So this is the domain. I could write that as negative infinity comma 5, which means if I went to graph this, the graph is going to exist everywhere to the left of 5, but not to the right of 5. So if I hit my y equals, clear this out, and graphed second square root 5 minus x, close out my parentheses, when I do my graph, my calculator gives me this. It gives me a graph that looks like that. 
and that is, has a domain of negative infinity to positive 5 because I extend it into this quadrant to the double infinity. I get the x coordinate of the far left point, the x coordinate of the far right point, which you'd have to kind of guess at, and that's why the domain is that exists. So you can have less thans in domains of square roots if there's a minus in front of the x. So not all square roots have domains that are greater than, so I can easily make them have less thans by putting a negative in front of the x. Now I'm getting short on time. 58 is a combined problem. The number to exclude from the domain is because of the fraction. So I need to ex exclude a number from the domain. That's by taking the entire denominator and setting it equal to 0. So if I take the denominator and set it equal to 0, I'll square both sides. The left side squaring cancels out a square root, gives me a 6 minus x. The right side 0 squared is 0. I'm going to add, yeah, adding x to both sides is actually kind of nice. Adding x to both sides, I get 6. So 6 is not part of the domain. Because if you plug 6 in, you get a 0 in the denominator, which is undefined. And now, I'll do the domain of the square root. I'm going to integrate these answers, two answers, into 1. The square root, what's under the square root is 6 minus x. I'm going to set that greater than or equal to 0. And again, when I have inequalities, I like to keep the x on the left-hand side. I minus x from both sides and get minus x is greater than or equal to minus 6. I divide both sides by negative 1. When I divide by negative 1, I switch. This gives me x is less than or equal to 6. The square root says if it was just a square root and not in a denominator of a fraction, the domain would be x is less than or equal to 6. The d fraction makes me exclude the domain, 6 from the domain. So I'm going to delete the 6 from the domain by taking the or equal to part out of that and say the domain is x is less than 6. Equivalently, that's any number between negative infinity and 6. If I go to graph this, the graph is going to exist everywhere to the left of 6, but not at 6. And it's not going to be a two-parted graph like most fractions. So just to show you again, if I hit y equals and did 4 divided by second square root of 6 minus x, when I hit my graph button, the graph exists everywhere to the left of 6, but not at 6. So this is where 6 is, and the graph does this. It exists everywhere to the left of 6, but it doesn't exist at 6, nor to the right of 6. This is why we say the domain is x is less than 6, or negative infinity to 6, because anywhere to the left of 6, but not at 6, the graph exists. The rest of the problems, I crammed them all on one page, because they're all no algebra. Every one of these problems is a polynomial. For our purposes, it doesn't have a fraction and it doesn't have a square root. Every one of these problems, if you do any algebra for the domain, you're likely just finding the x-intercept, which is nice, but it has nothing to do with the domain. So what these four problems have in common is they're all polynomials. And polynomials have no breaks in the graph. They don't have a starting or stopping point. I'll go ahead and sketch a graph or two just so you can see. If I graphed the first function, 3x plus 6 on my calculator, I don't need my calculator to graph that, but I could. The graph looks like this. There's no breaks in it. I, if I extended it, it extend all the way down and to the left to the double negative infinity and all the way up and to the right to the double positive infinity. The domain would be the x coordinate of the far left point and then the x coordinate of the far right point, which is negative and positive infinity. The algebra, the negative 2 that would come out if you set this equal to 0, it's the x-intercept, which has nothing to do with the domain. Similarly, if I sketch a graph for problem 62, y equals x squared plus 4. Graph is a parabola that would need to be extended. Again, a graph looks something like this. It extends up and to the left 
to the point negative positive infinity. So it's supposed to be double negative there. And up and to the right to double positive. The domain would be the x coordinate of the far left point and the x coordinate of the far right point, which are negative and positive infinity. Each of the next two problems, 66 and 64, if I took the time to graph them, the graphs would be unbroken and they would need to be extended and the domain would be negative to positive infinity. So what they have in common, these last four problems, quickly I look at them, there's no square root and there's no fraction. That combination together is going to give me a domain of all real numbers. So again, so there's fractions and for the fractions, there's algebra to do. The algebra doesn't give you the domain, it gives you the number to exclude from the domain. There's square root. You do the radicam greater than or equal to zero. And there's polynomials. There's no algebra for those. So there were three kinds of problems in this last grouping. Some of them in combine fractions and square roots together. But it's going to be important when you get to the test to be able to differentiate. When I give you an equation, I ask you to find the domain. You should be able to run through the algebra. You can rely on your calculator. It'll take you most of the way. But on the test, I expect to see algebra for problems that have functions without graphs. All right, so that hopefully that's good and I didn't make too many mistakes.